that's here. And Father, I just pray that you would please just bless this service this morning and stir us all up, dear God, and help us to uh, help us to learn something this morning that would stir us to greater service for you, that would bring us a little bit back to the reality of, of the truth of the Bible. And in Jesus' name I pray, amen. Now this is a very famous passage in the Bible, of course, Luke chapter 16, especially the latter part, uh, discussing the rich man who died and went to hell. Now hell is a horrible, awful place. The Bible says in verse 23, if you look at it, the Bible reads, And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Now flip over, if you would, to Matthew 25. We're going to be back in Luke 16. But flip over to Matthew chapter 25. The Bible says, In hell he lift up his eyes, being in torment. So a man in, in Luke chapter 16, he died... And moments later, from the time that he bowed his head and breathed his last breath, the Bible says by the time he lifted up his eyes, he was already in hell. You say, now wait a minute, Pastor Anderson. If a person dies unsaved, don't they go and stand before God and they're judged by God? Absolutely not. The Bible says, he that believeth on the Son... The Bible says in, in John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent not his Son to the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already. See, he doesn't need to stand before God and be judged. He's already been condemned by the Bible. The judgment's already happened. The Bible says, he that believeth not is condemned already, because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. We'll get, we'll get to that a little later. But look at Matthew chapter 25, verse number 41. You know, the doctrine of hell is under attack this morning. Churches all over America do not believe in hell the way that they used to. There are even many Baptists who do not believe in a literal, fiery hell. Now, it's something that none of us would like to think about. But it's something that we must think about. Paul said to Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 4, he said, meditate upon these things. Give thyself wholly to them. Hey, the Bible speaks a lot about hell, and we're to meditate on hell from time to time, that will stir us to greater service for God, that will help us to remember that there's an unsaved world out there that needs the gospel. We need to think about this thing of hell. But the doctrine of hell is under attack, even among independent fundamental Baptists, even among Baptists, even among the, the evangelical so-called Christians are not believing in hell as they used to. For example, I was, uh, I was sitting in a Bible college, and the teacher asked a question. He said, what's the worst part about hell? And uh, somebody shot up their hand like that. And he pointed to them and they said, the worst part about hell is the separation from God. Now, let me show you the worst part about hell. Look at Matthew chapter 25, verse 41. The Bible says in Matthew 25, verse 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. And then look down at the last verse of the chapter. And these shall go away into everlasting fire. Punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. No, the worst part about hell is not being separated from God. And I'll show you a little later that in hell you will not be separated from God. The Bible clearly tells us what the worst part about God is. It's one word, everlasting. The worst part about hell is that it's everlasting. And the teacher at the time, and, I, and I, I'm glad the teacher rebuked the, the, the boy who said that. He said, you know what? He said, you're like a mindless parrot. And I was shocked that he was so rude to the guy. But he said, you're just repeating something that you've heard somebody say your whole life. He said, that's not even in the Bible. He said, the Bible does not teach that it's separation from God. He said, the worst part about hell is the fact that it lasts forever. The worst part about hell is that there's no hope. The worst part about hell is that it's an eternal destination for the unsaved, that it lasts forever. The Bible says clearly in Matthew 25, he says it's everlasting fire, and he says it's everlasting punishment. A punishment that lasts forever. Now, think about when my children do wrong. When my children do wrong, I, I spank them, as the Bible says. I discipline them physically, corporal punishment, as the Bible teaches. Now, when I discipline them, you know what the wonderful thing about spanking your kids is that it's over. Once I discipline them, I never have to bring it up again. I don't have to give them some kind of a verbal brow beating. Hey, I spank them, and the punishment's over. But see, with hell, the punishment's never over. It's an everlasting punishment. It's a spanking that never ends. See, my children are my children. We're God's children. When God chastens us, when God punishes us as his children, 
it's just a temporal punishment in this life where he, he disciplines us. Maybe he might cause me to lose my job if I'm dishonest on the job. He might cause me to get in a car accident if I did wrong. But, he, but he's never going to damn me to hell. But see, the unbelievers, the unsaved that are not God's children, will face a punishment of eternal damnation in hell. Now flip back, if you would, to Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter 3. Now remember the Bible said in Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. You say, why would God make such an awful, horrible place, this torture chamber, this furnace of fire, as the Bible calls it in the book of Matthew, why would he create such an awful place? Why would a loving God create such an abominable place? Well... The answer is simple. He created it for the devil and his angels. He had no intention of man going there. God's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. See, God created it for the devil and his angels. But look at you what at Genesis chapter 3, and we'll see what happened. In Genesis chapter 3, verse number 4, the Bible says, And the serpent said unto the woman, Ye shall not surely die. For God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, then your eyes shall be opened, and you shall be as God's knowing good and evil. So, the devil here tells Eve, he says, if you eat of this fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, which God has forbidden you, if you take a bite of this fruit, he says, you will be like God? No, that's not what he said. He said, you'll be like gods. Now, study the word God, lowercase g, all throughout the Bible. It only ever refers to one thing, devils, demons, false gods. And so, he's tricking Eve. What he's saying is kind of true, and kind of not true. That's the way the devil is. He never just tells you just a bold-faced lie. He, take, he takes the truth and he changes it a little bit. And that is a lie, by the way. Because if you take the truth and just change it a little bit, you've lied. And so the devil here takes the truth and he just changes it a little bit. He says, you're going to be like God's. Now, what happens to the devils and his, and his angels? Now, they're not in hell yet, but one day their abode will be in the lake of fire forever. And so, because mankind chose to follow the devil, instead of following God, when mankind chose to follow the devil and his angels, God had no choice but to damn mankind in the same way that he damned the devil and his angels. Because he says, if you go down the road that the devil and his angels are going down, of sin and disobedience to God, he says you're going to have to end up where they end up, because the wages of sin is death. And so you'll have to go to hell. So God, it breaks God's heart every time a person enters into hell. But everyone had their chance to be saved and they rejected it. Look at Mark chapter 9. Mark chapter 9. And this is all introductory into the sermon, but Mark chapter 9. Look at verse number 43 of Mark chapter 9. The Bible reads in Mark 9, 43. And if thy hand offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into life maimed than having two hands to go into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. And if thy foot offend thee, cut it off. It is better for thee to enter into, into I'm sorry, for it is better for thee to enter halt into life than having two feet to be cast into hell, into the fire that never shall be quenched. And if thine eye offend thee, pluck it out. It is better for thee to enter into the kingdom of God with one eye than having two eyes to be cast into hell fire, where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. For everyone shall be salted with fire, and every sacrifice shall be salted with salt. Now let me read for you some quotations here. Here are some quotations from some of the religious leaders of our day. Here's, the, here's Pope John Paul II, not, not the current uh, pope that's... that's uh, there in Rome, but this is the, the Pope before him, the head of the Roman Catholic religion, Pope John Paul II. This is what he said on July 28, 1999, in an address he gave to about 8,500 people. He described hell as the complete frustration and emptiness of life without God. He said, that's what hell is. He said, rather than a physical place, so he's saying hell is not a physical place, hell is the state of those who freely and definitively separate themselves from God the source of all life and joy. Damnation consists precisely, I'm still reading the quote from John Paul, damnation consists precisely in definitive separation from God, freely chosen by the human person and confirmed with death that seals his choice forever. Listen to this. The thought of hell, and even less the improper use of biblical images, must not create anxiety or despair. <laughs> because he wants you to go to hell. 
So he says, don't be scared of going to hell. Hey, it shouldn't make you anxious or despair. Hey, hey, Roman Catholics. Hey, one billion people of the Roman Catholic religion. Hey, 8,500 Roman Catholics that are listening to me. Don't worry about hell. It's not that scary. It's just when people are separated from God. Well, Pope John Paul II is burning in hell right now. And he knows that hell is not separation from God. And he knows that hell is a real place of literal fire and torment. You say, well, I agree with Pope John Paul because I just don't think that you should try to scare people with hell. Well, didn't Jesus say, if your right hand offends thee, cut it off and cast it from thee? He said, if my right, he said, if your right hand is keeping you from getting saved, chop it off. Because the pain of removing your own hand would be better than the pain that you're going to endure in everlasting punishment in hellfire. He said the pain and the, the agony of going through life without a foot and removing your own foot from your body, he said, can't compare to what you're going to face in hell. Well, it sounds like he was scaring people a little bit. It sounds like he's trying to put the fear of God into people. It sounds like he loves people enough to tell them the truth and to warn them about an awful place called hell. Here's what, the, uh, here's what Billy Graham, Billy Graham, America's preacher, Here's what Billy Graham said about Hill. This is in uh, 1993 in an interview with Time magazine. The only thing I could say for sure is that hell means separation from God. That's all I know for sure is what he's saying. And we're going to go into that in a minute. All I know for sure about hell is that it's separation from God. The one, the one part about it that's not true. Okay, that's all he knows for sure. <laughs> and then it says, we are separated from his light, his fellowship. That is going to be hell. And by the way, Billy Graham's a Baptist. When it comes to a literal, literal fire, I don't preach it. Okay? Uh, unlike Jesus, he doesn't preach the literal fire of hell. Because I'm not sure about it. When the scripture uses fire concerning hell, that is possibly an illustration of how terrible it's going to be. Not fire, but something worse. A thirst for God that cannot be quenched. Now, would you rather have a thirst for God that can't be quenched or have somebody to light you on fire? I mean, think about that for a second. I mean, I'm just trying to logically... Come and let us reason together, the Bible says. God's a very reasonable God. What's worse? Oh, boy, I wish I could know God deeply. Okay. Or having somebody pour gasoline on you and light you on fire. Think, think about the ridiculousness of, of, uh, of religion that's taught. Could it be that fire, this is, this, is, uh, this is him preaching in 1969. Okay, you say, Billy Graham used to be fundamental. No, he didn't. It's 1969. Could it be that the fire Jesus talked about is an eternal search for God that's never quenched? Is that what it means? That indeed would be hell. To be away from God forever, separated from his presence. So not only is the Pope, you know, he's trying to get people not to be afraid of hell. Not only is Billy Graham trying to stop people from getting uh, scared of hell. Of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses, I don't have time to read it, but I have several quotes from the Jehovah's Witnesses saying that hell does not exist in a literal way. But not only that, but the, the modern Bible versions of our day have, have waged an attack on hell as well. I have in my hand the New International Version of the Bible which uh, was printed in the New Testament in 1973, the Old Testament in 1980. And the New International Version of the Bible is the most popular Bible version in the world, second only to one, the King James Bible, which, despite what you think walking into the Christian bookstore, is the number one best-selling Bible every year. 2005, 2006, 2007. You know, you've got to find it in the back corner of the Christian bookstore because they, they, they push you know, the, the new versions. The KJV has always been the best-seller. It sells itself. It needs no salesman. God is its salesman. But in the NIV here, you will read all the way until you get to Matthew chapter number, I believe it's Matthew chapter number 8, before you'll see the word hell. So you'll read the entire Old Testament, never a mention of hell in this Bible, in the NIV, until you get to Matthew chapter 8. Okay? So it remo and then it removes half of the references to hell in the New Testament also. It removes the word hell half the time. But listen to this, if you would. Turn in your Bible to 1 Thessalonians and we'll, we'll examine, is hell really separation from God? Look at 1 Thessalonians. I'm, I'm sorry, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. I'm sorry, I had to turn to the wrong place. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. And we'll see what the Bible says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. The Bible reads in 2 Thessalonians 1, 7, And to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. 
when he shall come to be glorified in the saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Now, keep your finger there and flip over to Revelation 14. Keep your finger there in 1 Thessalonians and flip over to Revelation 14. Maybe a little bit more like a Bible study this morning than a, than a Sunday morning sermon, but look at Revelation chapter 14 and look, if you would, at verse number 9. The Bible reads in Revelation 14, 9, And the third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now tell me that that doesn't say that the people in hell will be tormented in the presence of Jesus Christ. You say, well, I don't believe that. Well, then you don't believe the Bible. You have some kind of tradition that's blocking your mind here. Look down at your Bible. Look at verse number 10. The Bible says that the unsaved will be tormented in the presence of the Lamb, in the presence of Jesus Christ. Now flip back to 1 Thessalonians where your finger is. Now read it again and see what it clearly says. It doesn't say what people try to change this verse because this is the only verse in the Bible that anybody uses to try to say that it's separation from God. It's not what it says at all. It says in verse number 9, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord. The destruction comes from the presence of the Lord being there. Otherwise, the Bible is contradicting Revelation 14. The Bible is clearly saying that the destruction of hell, the fires of hell, the torment of hell is coming from the fact that God himself is there. Let me read another verse for you. Isaiah chapter 30, verse 33. You don't have to turn there. For Tophet is ordained of old. And this is a metaphor that God's using for hell. Yea, for the king it is prepared. He hath made it deep and large. The pile thereof is fire and much wood. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of brimstone, doth kindle it. You see that? Hell is the culmination of God's wrath. Hell is being in the center of God's wrath. It's the cup of his fierce indignation, which is poured out without mixture upon the ungodly, as it said in Revelation 14. See, hell is a place where you're confronted with the holiness of God, and, God's, and the, God is destroying you in a place called hell. Jesus Christ is the one doing the tormenting. Of course, we all have in our mind this picture of the devil down in hell. You know, porky pig, dressed up like the devil. You know, people, you know, you watch these Looney Tunes cartoons, and they always try to warp the things of God. They warp everything about the Bible, you know, TV. That's why we shouldn't watch TV. But, you know, Porky Pig's down in hell, and he's got the little mustache, and he's got the pitchfork, and he's poking people. Look, the devil is going to be tormented in hell, along with the unsaved. The devil is not doing the tormenting. Who's doing the tormenting? Jesus Christ, God himself. It's the wrath of God, my friend, poured out upon the ungodly. Now, let me open my NIV here that I was holding in my hand, which removes hell so many times. Listen to what they changed the Bible to. Look down at your Bible in 2 Thessalonians 1.9. And this is what the Bible says, or I'm sorry, this is what the NIV says. They will be punished with everlasting destruction and shut out from the presence of the Lord. See how they just add in a few words that totally change the meaning? See, in the King James Bible, it's clear that they're being punished with destruction from God. Destruction from the presence of God. Not away from God. Not shut out from God. But the NIV adds in a few words here and says that they will be shut out from the presence of the Lord. See, you can tell where these, these preachers are getting it. That are repeating that over and over. What? Separation from God. What? Separation from God. You know, they just keep repeating it over and over. Hey, they got it from the NIV. Hey, they got it from a phony Catholic Bible. That's where they got it. It had to come from somewhere. And they repeat it, and they repeat it, and they repeat it. Hey, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that need not to be ashamed. Hey, read Revelation 14, where the Bible says that the people in hell will be tormented in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Of course, a famous verse in uh, the book of Psalms, you don't have to turn there, Psalm 139, 8. If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, speaking to God, behold, thou art there. The Bible says God's in heaven. God's in the earth. God's in hell. Hey, God's everywhere. God's omnipresent. God is in all places. He fills all things, the Bible says. He is everywhere. Jesus Christ said in John 3, 13, No man hath ascended up unto heaven, but he who came down from heaven, even the Son of Man, which is in heaven. So Jesus Christ was in heaven while he's talking to Nicodemus because he's omnipresent, because he's everywhere at the same time. And so that's very clear in the Bible. Amos 9, 2. 
Though they dig into hell, the Bible says, thence shall mine hand take them. Though they climb up to heaven, thence will I bring them down. Okay? So God, God is in hell. God's presence is there in hell. God's the one who created hell. God's the one who torments people in the lake of fire and hell forever. Now, my first point this morning is that, of course, hell is a place of literal fire and torment. And we already talked about that. But number two, hell is a real physical place. Did you know that? Hell is not just a spiritual concept. Hell is a real physical place. Turn, if you would, to Numbers chapter 16. The book of Numbers, the fourth book in the Old Testament. Numbers chapter 16, and we'll see that hell is a real physical place. It has a physical location. It has physical attributes. Look, if you would, at Numbers chapter 16. And we'll see in Numbers 16, verse number 28. The Bible reads in Numbers 16, 28. This is the story about Moses confronting uh, Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, rebelling against God and rebelling against the man of God, Moses. And look, if you would, at verse number 28. And Moses said, Hereby ye shall know that the Lord hath sent me to do all these works. For I have not done them of mine own mind. If these men die the common death of all men, he's talking about Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, or if they be visited after the visitation of all men, then the Lord hath not sent me. Sorry, I lost my place here. But if the Lord make a new thing, and the earth open her mouth, and swallow them up, with all that appertain unto them, and they go down quick, quick means alive, and they go down quick into the pit, then ye shall understand that these men have provoked the Lord. And it came to pass, as he had made an end of speaking all these words, that the ground clave asunder that was under them, and the earth opened her mouth, and swallowed them up in their houses, and all the men that appertained unto Korah, and all their goods, they and all that appertained to them, went down alive into the pit. And the earth closed upon them, and they perished from among the congregation. Now you have to understand that the Bible is very clear that the hell is in the lower parts of the earth. The Bible talks about this in Ezekiel 30 and 31. About uh, seven different times it says that hell is in the lower parts of the earth, in the nether parts of the earth. The Bible talks about descending into hell, digging down into hell. The Bible talks about Jesus being in the heart of the earth for three days and three nights. He said in Jonah chapter 2, verse 2, out of the belly of hell cried I. Uh, Acts 2.31, this spake he of the resurrection of Christ, that his soul was not left in hell, neither did his flesh see corruption. You see, the Bible is clear that hell is in the heart of of a spherical earth. That hell is down in the depths of the earth. Well, I remember when I was in science class as a kid, it always boggled my mind when we went to the geology chapter and we would sit and look at the earth, how it was just one to ten miles thick of crust made of rock and dirt and and then there's the bedrock and then there's the groundwater and one to ten miles thick is the crust of the earth. What's the rest of it? Fire. Nothing but, nothing but thousands and thousands of degrees of fire. Boy, isn't that amazing? You, you wonder, does the unsaved world ever scratch their head and wonder why the, the heart of the earth is a, is a fireball that's hotter than anything that's on the face of this earth? It's hotter than they can even simulate in any hottest oven that they could create. I mean, why it's so hot down there, they can't understand. They don't know why. They come up with all kinds of theories about it. None of it makes sense. Hell is in the center of the earth. Hell is a real physical place. If you were to go down from where my feet are standing right now, if you were to go straight down and keep going and going and going, eventually you would reach the depths of hell. So the Bible is very clear. The Bible teaches that. And so hell, look at, uh, look at Revelation chapter 20, last book in the Bible. Flip back to Revelation chapter 20. And so we saw in that story, Dathan and environment Korah, the earth opened up and they actually dropped alive into hell. And the Bible says they died on the way down. They died on the way down into hell. They dropped straight into hell from the face of the earth. It was a new thing. It was the first time that that had ever happened. Probably the last time that that ever happened. And so the Bible says in Revelation 20, verse 1, we'll see another description of hell. The Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit. We know from our studies in Revelation, in chapter 9, that that angel's name is Apollyon, God's angel of the bottomless pit, who opens and shuts the bottomless pit. And the Bible says, And I saw an angel come down from heaven, having the key of the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, that old serpent, which is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years, and cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up, and set a seal upon him, and so forth. See, the the hell is referred to as a bottomless pit. Well, why is that? Because in hell there's going to be no gravity because it's in the center of the earth. The whole gravitational pull of the earth comes from the earth. If you're in the center of the earth, 
Which way are you going to fall? Up, down, left, right? You're going to be just falling in a bottomless pit in the center of the earth. That's why the Bible calls it the bottomless pit. So we see that if hell has a real physical location, it's a real literal place of fire and brimstone and torment and agony. Isaiah 5.14, the Bible says, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself. Talking about many people who are going to be dying. Many unsaved people who are going to be killed in a battle. He said, Therefore hell hath enlarged herself and opened her mouth without measure. And their glory and their multitude and their pomp and he that rejoiceth shall descend into it. See, this place had to get bigger. Okay? It had to get larger as people go into hell. The Bible says it gets larger and larger. That's why the Bible says in uh, Habakkuk chapter 2, Who enlargeth his desire is hell. And is as death and never can be satisfied. And so hell and, the, hell and destruction are never full, the Bible says. Because it just keeps getting bigger, as need be. See, God made it for the devil and his angels. He didn't make it a huge place. But he has to keep making it bigger and bigger as people die without Christ and go to hell. Of course, you study the size of heaven. It's big enough for every human being who's ever lived to go to heaven. So It's so huge and large. Because God doesn't want anybody to go to hell. He wishes that everyone will be saved. But not only is hell a place of fire and torment, not only is it a literal physical place, but it's also a place of smothering smoke. The Bible says in, in Revelation 14, 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night who worship the beast in his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Hell is a place of dismal darkness. The Bible says in Jude 1, 13, Raging waves of the sea, foaming out their own shame, wandering stars to whom is reserved the blackness of darkness forever. Hell is a place of screaming and crying and wailing. The Bible says in Matthew 22, Then said the king to the servants, Bind him hand and foot, and take him away, and cast him into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Hell is a place of everlasting chains. The Bible says in Jude 1, 6, And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation, he had reserved an everlasting chains under darkness, under the judgment of the great day. How would you have to be chained up for all eternity? Have you ever been somewhere where you couldn't really move around much? I used to call under houses for my dad running electrical wiring. My job right now, I still do a lot of attic crawling and crawling into tight spaces. Boy, have you ever been in a tight place for a long time? I've, I've gotten bunched up somewhere to work on some, some wiring before. And, you know, a couple hours go by because you're working on something that's elaborate, you don't realize, or even sometimes just 45 minutes or an hour go by. And you try to get out and you can't really straighten up. And you've got to straighten up really slow because you've been hunched over so long. Who's ever experienced that before? Well, how would you like to be in a cramped up space forever? Ugh. It's, it's, hell's a horrible place. I mean, it's a place of total darkness. The Bible says it's a darkness that may be felt. I mean, it's so dark you can feel the darkness. I mean, it's a place where you feel the pain of literal fire burning your body. It's a place where you can't quite get a breath of clean air because of the smoke that's ascending out of it. And it's a place where there's, there's fire and brimstone and and where you can't really move around like you want to, maybe because you're chained there forever. What a horrible place. What a terrible place. I don't want to think about it either. But we must think about these things because it's reality. And, and instead of just turning a blind eye and saying, well, if I just ignore it, it'll go away, why don't we just face the reality of hell and say there's a real hell and I need to do everything I can. I need to give every breath of my body to getting as many people saved and not on their way to hell as I possibly can. And there's so much more about hell. I mean, the Bible teaches that there are creatures in hell. The Bible talks about there being worms in hell. The Bible talks about worms eating the flesh of someone who went to hell in Isaiah chapter 14. The Bible talks about uh, locusts being in hell in Revelation chapter 9. These locusts that tormented men and sting them for five months, those locusts have been in hell for thousands of years now, because they were created in the first seven days of creation when God made everything that's in the earth and in the heaven and everything that, that's been made. And so they've been there right now tormenting the people of hell forever. The Bible says in Revelation 14, 11, the smoke of their torment is sent up forever and ever, and they have no rest day nor night. Boy, have you ever been sleep deprived? Have you ever been really sleep deprived where you didn't sleep for days or you didn't sleep for a whole night? Or One time the most sleep deprived I've ever been is I went a whole night without sleep and I slept two hours the next night. And I went all the way until that night. And boy, that is torture in and of itself not to be able to sleep. But you can't rest in hell. There's no rest. There's not even a break. There's not even a moment of respite from the fires of hell. The Bible teaches. Hey, why does God go into such a graphic description of hell? Why does God take so much time and so much uh, just detail 
to tell us what hell is like. It's because it's a horrible place. He doesn't want us to go there. He says, I want you to comprehend what it's like. I can't even put it on a printed page exactly what it's like. You just have to be there to know what it's like. But he says, I'm trying to express to you in, a, in as powerful of a way as I can so that you'll warn everybody not to go to that horrible place of torment. Now, let's go back to... Well, actually, before we get into that, look at Matthew chapter nine, Matthew chapter 10, verse number 28. And I want to show you some things about hell doctrinally that some people are confused about. And let me just see if I can clear this up for you. It's, it's so, the Bible is really simple, but what happens is sometimes we've been taught something our whole life that's a little bit off. And so that's kind of a preconceived idea we have. And so we approach the Bible from that standpoint. We become confused when the Bible doesn't line up with our paradigm that we already had. But this is actually very simple. The Bible teaches this clearly. Look at Matthew chapter 10, verse number 28. The Bible reads, oh, whoops, I'm in chapter 11. Matthew 10, 28, the Bible reads, And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. Now the Bible says here that God will destroy both soul and body in hell. Now when a person dies, and, and Think about this for a moment. The Bible is very simple, but you just have to put out any preconceived notion. When a person dies, does their body go to hell right then? No. I mean, you can see their body, right? I mean, if, if an unsaved person died, and of course Jesus said, Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. So the believers will never die. But when an unsaved person dies, does their body go to hell that second? Well, no. What's being buried? I mean, somebody takes the body. You have to think about these things. They take the body and they bury it. Okay? And, and everybody can look at the body. Their soul goes to hell. Okay? A person's soul who's unsaved goes straight to hell. Immediately. Remember the rich man? He lifted up his eyes and he was in hell. That fast. Now, when their soul is in hell, their body is buried in the ground. That body will stay buried in the ground until the resurrection, the second resurrection, after the millennium. Now look, if you would, at Revelation chapter 19. Revelation chapter 19. See, there's a, there's a place that's not mentioned in the Bible by name, really. It's not really talked much about until Revelation 19. That place is called the Lake of Fire. Now, there are two different places, okay? Hell and the Lake of Fire, two different places. Hell is called the Furnace of Fire. Hell is called the Bottomless Pit, the pit wherein is no water, the pit all throughout the Old Testament. That's hell in the center of the earth. But in the end of the book of Revelation, we see a new place mentioned, the Lake of Fire, which is in outer darkness. Listen to what the Bible reads in verse number 20. Let's start reading. And the beast was taken, and with him the false prophet that wrought miracles before him, with which he deceived them that had received the mark of the beast, and them that worshipped his image. These both were cast alive into a lake of fire, burning with brimstone. And the remnant were slain with the sword of him that sat upon the horse, which sword proceeded out of his mouth, and all the fowls were filled with their flesh. So we see here in Revelation 19.20 that the beast and the false prophet, the Antichrist and the false prophet, were cast into the lake of fire, a place that has not yet been mentioned. Now look over at Revelation chapter 20, verse 10. The Bible says, and this is after the millennium now. That was before the millennium. The beast and the false prophet were cast into the lake of fire. In verse 10 of Revelation 20, the Bible reads, And the devil that deceived them was cast into the lake of fire and brimstone where the beast and the false prophet are. Okay? And shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. So the first people that we saw in the history of mankind go to the lake of fire are going to be the Antichrist and the false prophet. That occurs in Revelation 19.20. Then in chapter 20, verse 10, after the millennium, a thousand years later exactly, the devil himself, Satan, is cast into the lake of fire where the beast and the false prophet already are. Now let's continue reading in verse 11. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were open. These are only the unsaved dead. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. Now watch this. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Now you see in verse number 14 that hell and the lake of fire are two different places. Okay? The people who are unsaved, they died, their body may be in the sea somewhere, 
or it may be laying in a grave somewhere. Their soul is in hell, but at the great white throne judgment, after the devil is cast into the lake of fire with the beast and the false prophet, then the Bible said that all the dead are going to stand before God. Now, the, the saved people, they've already been resurrected. They're not dead. They, they've been you know, already made alive forever, eternally, and so forth uh, a long time ago. But the unsaved are going to be reunited with their body. There's going to be a resurrection that takes place of the dead, the resurrection of the unjust. And that, those people are going to come up out of hell where they've been for thousands of years. Their soul's been burning in hell. It's going to be reunited with their body. And they're going to stand before God, and God's going to judge them according to their works. Then the Bible says that death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. Hell is going to be relocated to the lake of fire. And then whosoever was not found in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So the first people to go to hell are the beast and the false prophet. A thousand years later, I, I mean the lake of fire, then the, the, a thousand years later the devil will be cast into the lake of fire. Then every unsaved person who's ever lived, hell will be relocated with them to the lake of fire, and that's where they'll spend eternity. See, on the new heaven and the new earth that's created in Revelation 21 and 22, hell will not be in the center of that new earth. There will be no hell there. Hell is going to be removed to a faraway place into outer darkness. And, and so this is, this is just simple Bible doctrine that the Bible teaches, that hell is where people are that are, that are unsaved now. At the final judgment, they're going to come out of hell, be judged, and cast back into the lake of fire, probably to determine you know, exactly what degree of punishment they're going to face in the lake of fire. And so that's very clear from the Bible. Now, there's a false doctrine out there. Flip back, if you would, to Luke chapter 16. Luke chapter 16. And, you know, I could just get up for an hour and just scream and yell about hell. Get people, you know, hell's horrible. But I like to teach the Bible because it's, it's so important that we know what we believe and why we believe it. It's so important that you have these things laid out to you and that you study even more, ten times more, that you study these things yourself and, and learn the Bible and know what you believe so that you can't be fooled and deceived. And you'd be shocked. You'd be shocked to know the people that are in Baptist churches their whole life and you talk to them about these things and they don't have a clue what you're talking about. You ask them a question and they... I mean, I've been in a Baptist church and I had the youth pastor tell me that he believed that, you know, when you die, if you're saved, just boom, it's just going to be like, you're just at the final judgment. Like, all the, all the time will just go by like that for you. Like, you won't be waiting, you know, or anything like that. or It won't be like you're in heaven for a while waiting, you know, before the rapture. It's just like, boom, you're just at the rapture when you die. It's like, where do you get this up? Or like, the, or I've had Baptists Baptist tell me that, well, when an unsaved person dies, and when, when saved people die, I think they're just asleep in the ground. And then, you know, the unsaved will be resurrected and cast into hell, and the saved will be resurrected and go to heaven. It's like, what are you talking about? The Bible's so clear that the moment a person dies, they go to heaven if they're saved, and the moment a person dies, they go to hell if they're unsaved. And, and the Bible talks about the people in heaven waiting, you know, waiting for the final judgment, waiting for these things. You know, the Bible's so clear, and so that's why I take the time to do this. And if you already know these things, you know, praise the Lord. But some people don't know all these things, and so I want to make sure that you understand what the Bible teaches. It's so clear. And so look back at Luke chapter 16, and I'm going to disprove a fallacy in the Bible. Now, here's the thing. Whenever there's a false doctrine, it's usually based on one verse. It's usually based on people ignoring the rest of the Bible's clear teaching and taking one verse. Remember how they took that one verse in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, and they even changed it a little and tried to say that hell was separation from God? That's so that pastors can get up in their pulpit and not mention the fire, not mention the smoke, not mention the darkness. They just get up and say, if you don't get saved, you're going to be separated from God in hell. That's not that scary. Unsaved people want to be separated from God. Hey, if they wanted to be with God, they'd be in church this morning. They're, they're, they don't want the house of God. They don't want the word of God. They don't want the man of God. Hey, they want nothing to do with God. That's why they get as far away from God as they can. But I'm going to tell you something. When the unsaved man dies, he's going to be confronted with the holy God that he wanted nothing to do with, and that's going to be his companion for all eternity, tormenting him in the lake of fire. He's going to have to face the God that he once hid from. When it, remember, remember when mankind says at the end of uh, Revelation chapter 6, fall on us to the rocks and mountains and hide us from the face of the Lamb. We don't want to see the face of the Lamb. We don't want to face His wrath, but they're going to face it for all eternity in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. But people will take one verse out of context. People will take James chapter 2 and say that salvation is by works. When the whole rest of the Bible makes it so clear that it's by faith, and they're misunderstanding the passage. You know, on and on. 
so many examples like that. False doctrine is always based on one verse. Well, here's the thing. People will take one scripture here in Luke chapter 16. Here's another example. And they'll get a twisted view of the whole rest of the Bible based on this one story that Jesus tells. Let me show you what I'm talking about. The Bible says in uh, Luke 16, in verse number 22, the Bible says, And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. And in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me, and send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. But Abraham said, Son, remember that thou in thy lifetime receivest thy good things, and likewise Lazarus evil things. But now he is comforted, and thou art tormented. And watch this next verse. And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. And we'll read the rest in a little bit. Now, some people, and, and in fact a lot of people, have taken this story. And nuts to what the other 1188 chapters of the Bible say, they will take this story and try to say that in the Old Testament, people who were saved did not go to heaven. Okay? They'll say the people who, went, who were saved went to a place called paradise. In the center of the earth. Right side by side with hell. There's a good side and a bad side. Okay? You go to hell, there's the good side and the bad side. The good side like, do, 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 do. You know, it's like paradise, right? Boy, that sounds like paradise, doesn't it? Being in the center of the earth right next to hell. Talking to Lazarus while he's burning in hell. Okay, obviously the story here is talking about a miraculous event that took place where this man's burning in hell and he, can, and he you know, somehow is allowed by God to see Abraham afar off. Now, this is not literally Abraham was not there down in the center of the earth with him. And I'll prove that to you from the Bible in a second. And so, no, Abraham was not down in the center of the earth. No people in hell right now are not conversing with all the saved people, begging them for drops of water every five minutes. It's not happening, okay? This is a story, this is, a, this is a, an event that literally did happen, but it was an event that God allowed to happen so that he could illustrate to us what hell is like. So he allowed this conversation to take place so that we could see what hell is like. Now, he says in the story, first of all, it says that he sees Abraham way far off, right? And it also says there's a great goal fixed between the two. Yet, he's able to speak with him and be heard. Okay, so obviously it's a miraculous event the same place. If he's that far away, and it's totally dark in hell according to the Bible, yet he can see Abraham, he can't see anything without light. He sees Abraham, he's talking to somebody that's way too far away to really be talked to, above all the screaming and wailing that's going on hell. Obviously it's a miraculous one-time event that took place. Now, to say that, that paradise was where Old Testament saints went. They didn't go to heaven. They went to paradise. Uh, in the center of the earth, Hades, Sheol. Now, no one would believe that if they were only reading the King James Bible. Because in order to believe that, you have to believe in a place called Hades, which is only mentioned in the NIV and only mentioned in modern Bibles. But listen to this. If paradise was the Old Testament location for saved people who died in the Old Testament, then why is the word paradise never used in the Old Testament? Okay, it's mentioned three times in the New Testament. Yet they claim that for the, uh, all the chapters, all the 39 books of the Old Testament, when people died and they were born again, Christians, you know, they went to paradise. They went to Sheol. They went to Hades in the center of the earth, into this uh, island getaway paradise where there's no gravity, where there's no sunshine. It doesn't sound that fun. Where there's no, uh, what good is it? But anyway, l listen to this scripture. Turn my page here. Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 20, and you don't have to turn there. All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and turn to dust again. Who knoweth the spirit of man that goeth upward, okay, yeah, that's Old Testament Ecclesiastes, the spirit of man that goeth upward, and the spirit of the beast that goeth downward to the earth. Or how about this one? And it came to pass as they still went on and talked, this is Elijah and Elisha, that there appeared a chariot of fire, and horses of fire, and part of them both. And Elijah went up by a whirlwind into heaven. No Old Testament saint ever went to heaven. Oh, really? Well, the Bible says right there that Elijah went up in a whirlwind to heaven. Oh, no, Pastor Anderson. It says in John 3.13 that no man hath ascended up to heaven. And the Bible says in Acts chapter 2 that David has not ascended into the heavens. Yet David didn't ascend into heaven. He was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. Yeah, Elijah didn't ascend into heaven. Only Jesus Christ ascended into heaven. They were, he was carried, Elijah was, by flaming chariot into heaven. 
No place in the Bible will you find uh, saved Christians going down into the center of the earth into some island getaway paradise. That is such a weird, warped doctrine to think that. I mean, I don't even understand uh, how you could take one verse in the Bible and, and come up with that. But how about this? Look at Job, and we were here on, I think it was Wednesday night, we were here briefly. But I want to dwell on it a little more. Look at the book of Job, chapter 1. And by the way, the, the word paradise is only mentioned three times in the entire Bible. They're all in the New Testament. The, the first time that it's mentioned is in Luke chapter 23 when Jesus says to the thief on the cross, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Now Jesus went to hell, but because he's omnipresent, he already said in chapter 3 that he was already up in heaven. The thief on the cross went to heaven that day and he was with Jesus Christ in paradise because Jesus Christ is outside of the realm of space and time. He's in heaven and in hell at the same time. Okay. If you don't understand that, then join the club. But the Bible says that that's the case, that that's true. Now, that's the first time it's mentioned. Today shall thou be with me in paradise. The second time it's mentioned is in 2 Corinthians chapter 12, when the Bible says, I knew a man, how that he was caught up into paradise. So which direction is paradise in 2 Corinthians chapter 12? Up. It's the only time it's mentioned. Caught up to paradise. And then it says he was caught up to the third heaven. So paradise and heaven are the same place and they're both up. Clear from the Bible. And then, of course, the Bible says, uh, Tim that overcometh will I give to eat of the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God in Revelation 3. Those are the only times it's mentioned. But you'll find a whole book about it written by a Roman Catholic in the 13th century named Dante, who wrote a book called The Divine Comedy, which described Inferno and Paradiso right next to each other in the center of the earth. It's a Catholic doctrine. And so, where did I have you turn? Or Job, okay. Job chapter 1. Can you come finish the sermon for me? <laughs> you know where I'm going with this, right? Okay. Job chapter 1. And uh, look if you would at, and I'll show you further proof that Old Testament born-again Christians were in heaven. Look at verse number 6. Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them. Now, where are the sons of God? Sounds like they're in heaven presenting themselves to God. And this is in the Old Testament. Did you know that Job is the oldest book in the Bible? Did you know that it was written before Genesis through Deuteronomy? Because it was actually written chronologically between the books of Genesis and Exodus, but the book of Genesis wasn't written until, you know, the time of Moses later on. And so the book of Job is the oldest book in the Bible. And here the Bible is clearly talking about the sons of God being in heaven, presenting themselves to God. You say, wait a minute, Pastor Anderson. You don't understand. The sons of God are angels. You see, I've got the NIV, Pastor Anderson. And in the NIV, in Job chapter 1, verse 6, the Bible says, one day the angels came to present themselves before the Lord. And so, Pastor Anderson, that doesn't work. It's the angels. Well, even in the NIV, i got the NIV in my hand, down in the footnote right here it says, Hebrew, the sons of God. So they're saying that in the Hebrew it says the sons of God. They took the liberty of changing it to angels. They're unapologetically changing the Bible. Saying, we know it says sons of God, but we're going to change it to angels because we think it's talking about angels. Now let me ask you something. Are the angels sons of God? Well, Hebrews 1.5 says, But unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. The Bible says, no, none of the angels is God's son. Hebrews 1.5, mark it down. None of the angels is God's son, the Bible says. Unto which of the angels said he at any time, Thou art my son, this day have I begotten thee. He said, they're, they're, they're ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation. And so, no, the angels are not the sons of God. Now, flip in your Bible to Job. You're in Job 1. Flip back to chapter 38. See, I can't believe you're teaching the Bible like this. Can't you just preach on, uh, can't you just preach on uh, comfort and love? And so, look, that's the problem with, with this country is that nobody teaches the Bible anymore. People don't know what they believe. You say, well, I just need something to get me through the week till next Sunday. Hey, this will get you through the rest of your life if you learn the Bible. Did you know that? Did you know that if you know the Bible? Did you know that if you realize there's a real hell and you go out soul winning every week? Hey, did you know that if you learn the Bible like the back of your hand and live by every word of this book, did you know that you'll be in church for a lifetime and it won't just be a vitamin pill that'll get you through to the next Sunday? Some feel-good, sugar-coated little message? Hey, this will keep you going forever. And so look down at your Bible in, in Job chapter 38... And look at verse 4. Here again, one verse to try to negate the Bible's clear teaching. But before you turn there, think about this verse. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, 
even to them that believe on his name. First John 3, 2. Beloved, now are we the sons of God. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. The angels are not like him. The angels are not the sons of God. We are the sons of God, beloved. And so, that's clear in the Bible. But look, here's the one verse that people will use and that the NIV translators used to say that the sons of God must be the angels. Okay? And I'm going to show you the fallacy of their thinking. Look at Job 38, verse 4. The Bible says in Job 38, verse 4, Where wast thou, speaking to Job, where wast thou when I laid the foundations of the earth? Declare if thou hast understanding. Who hath laid the measures thereof, if thou knowest? Or who hath stretched the line upon it? Whereupon are the foundations thereof fastened? Or who laid the cornerstone thereof? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. Now, the reason that people wrongly believe that the sons of God is referring to angels is because they look at this verse right here and they say, well, the Bible says when the foundation of the earth was laid, then the sons of God shouted for joy. And the sons of God didn't exist yet. But here's the problem with their thinking. I'm going to prove it wrong in a second. Think about this. Were the angels there when God laid the foundation of the earth? No. Because in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the Bible says in six days, in, in Exodus 20, this is kind of a review from Wednesday night, but I'm going into a little deeper. In six days, God created the heaven and the earth and all that in the midst. Okay. God, in those six days of creation, created everything in heaven, everything in earth. See, angels and all these other things did not exist before God created the earth. Because in the beginning, God created the earth and he created all those things that dwell in heaven. And animals, the beasts, the angels, the cherubims, the servants. He created everything in that time, according to the Bible. But look, that's not even what the Bible says here. Read it carefully. Look at it again. It says right here, where are the foundations there are fastened in verse number 6? But then he, he starts a new question. Or, who laid the cornerstone thereof when the morning stars sang together and all the sons of God shouted for joy? So, God is not saying that the sons of God shouted for joy when the foundation of the earth was laid. Look at it. He says that the sons of God shouted for joy when he laid the cornerstone thereof. Did you know that the word cornerstone is mentioned in 11 verses in the Bible? Ten of them are a direct reference to Jesus Christ every time. I mean, ten of them are Jesus Christ. This is the 11th one. So God says, when he laid the foundation of the earth, but he said, when I laid the cornerstone thereof was Jesus Christ, when Jesus Christ died and was buried and rose again, when Jesus rose again, he said, the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. This is the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. See, the Bible says that when Jesus died and was buried, but when he up from the grave he arose, it said he was laid as the cornerstone of the earth, and the sons of God that were in heaven, the born-again saved Christians, who for 4,000 years have been waiting in heaven, said, Hallelujah! Jesus Christ has become the chief cornerstone. Crown him with many crowns. King of kings. Lord of lords. All power is given unto him. Jesus Christ, the chief cornerstone. Look it up. Every time. I mean, I'm not saying most of the time. I'm not saying half the time. I mean, every time the word cornerstone is used, it's talking about Jesus Christ. The, the stone which the builders rejected is become the head of the corner. Jesus Christ being the chief cornerstone, the Bible says in 1 Peter. And so that's when the sons of God shouted together, or, or I mean, when the, when the morning stars sang together, okay? The morning stars are the angels. That's what he's talking about. They're singing together, because the Bible refers to the angels as stars in the book of Revelation. We saw that on Wednesday night. And the sons of God shouted for joy when Jesus Christ rose from the dead. But see, that's, what, that's, the, that's the road you go down when you start changing the Bible. You know, they didn't study the Bible well enough to understand that. They didn't even say the Bible enough to know that Jesus Christ is the cornerstone, that God didn't lay some imaginary cornerstone when he created the earth 6,000 years ago. They didn't study that. And then they said, you know, we're gonna, since we're so smart and we know that it's talking about angels, because of that one verse, now we're going to change the whole Bible. Every time it says sons of God in the Old Testament, we're going to change it to angels. Is this Bible your authority? I hope not, because this, this NIV Bible is just, it's a real piece of work. And they, they change things at a whim. And they do your thinking for you. And uh, I think it's created by the devil. I'll be honest with you. 
And so we see that that's so clear. But look back at Luke chapter 16 with all that being said. Luke chapter 16. And so we, we see clearly that Hell is a real, physical, fiery place of torment in the center of the earth. God's people have never been anywhere near it. God's people will never go there. God's people have always gone to heaven to be absent from the body, is to be present with the Lord, the Bible says. And on and on throughout the Bible we see that clearly Old Testament saints being caught up to heaven, going up to heaven, and so forth. But look at Luke chapter 16, and I'll I'll close with this. I hope you understand a little bit better the doctrines of hell this morning, and it makes a little more sense to you because there's so much false teaching out there. But the Bible says in uh, verse number 26, And beside all this, between us and you, there is a great gulf fixed, so that they which would pass from hence to you cannot. Neither can they pass to us that would come from thence. Then he said, I pray thee therefore, Father, that thou would ascend him to my father's house. For I have five brethren, that he may testify unto them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. And he said, Nay, Father Abraham, but if one went unto them from the dead, they will repent. Have you ever heard somebody say, I want to go to hell because that's where all my friends are? Have you ever people laugh and say that out so funny? Hey, I'm going to hell. That's where all my friends are. Here's a man who said, I don't want my friends to be here. I mean, here's a man who said, I've been in hell now for a little while. And he said, I hope I never see my brother that I love. I mean, you know, if you don't notice that people who have a lot of kids, usually big families are pretty close. Right? Have you ever noticed that? People have a lot of kids. Sometimes it's usually a pretty close-knit family. I, I think this man really loved his brothers. I mean, he, he, he loved his, his five brothers. He probably grew up, spent time with them. I mean, they, they shared so many experiences together. I'm sure that they'd spent a lot of time together in, in the world. But he said, you know what? Please, would you just tell them to never come here? Please, would you just tell them to never I hope I never even see my brothers again. Because I wouldn't wish this on anybody is what he's saying. And he says, would you please send Lazarus back to warn them, lest they come also into this place of torment. Do you have the same feeling in your heart right now as an unsaved man who's burning in hell? I mean, an unsaved, ungodly man who rejected Jesus Christ. He still had enough love to say, I wish somebody would go tell my family the gospel. I I mean, he's, he's down below my feet right now as I speak. I wish that somebody would please go warn my mom and dad. I wish somebody would tell my, my grandmother or my granddaughter not to come to this horrible, awful place. Hey, I wish that we could get some of the spirit of that man in us where we would say, I will be the one to go warn somebody's brother, somebody's sister, somebody's mother. You say, oh, I just, I'm just not really into this soul winning thing. Hey, would you, what if it's your mom that's, that's, that lives somewhere here in Tempe? What if it were your brother or sister that lived somewhere here in Tempe, Arizona? Maybe there's some, uh, what if there's some born-again Christian somewhere in, uh, in Minnesota or in Illinois or in Ohio somewhere that's on their knees praying to God for some relative, praying to God for some friend, praying to God for somebody who lives in Tempe, Arizona. Oh God, would you please send someone to warn them not to go to this place of torment called hell. Salvation's so free. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. There are so many people that they would just hear the gospel. Faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. If somebody would just preach the gospel to them, they'd get saved. If somebody would tell them. And so that person's on their knees praying. I'm going to tell you something. I believe that when I get in my car and drive to that neighborhood somewhere, I believe that when I get out of the car and, and walk down the street, I believe that when I come to a street where I can go straight or left or right, I believe that God is leading me. Because the Bible says, in all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. The steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. I believe God is leading me. And I believe that soul winning is a spiritual action where God can lead me to someone who someone else has been praying for. He can lead me to the loved one of some uh, saved, born-again Christian somewhere who's been begging God that, that somebody would go talk to him. Or that, or that he would lead me to somebody... You say, well, I just, I just don't believe in this soul winning thing. I, where are all these people you went to the Lord? Hey, where were you the first eight years that you were saved? Hey, where were you all those years that you were saved? Huh? Where were you all those years that you were saved and, and baptized? Huh? Where were you all those years? I can go around the room and point at the people who got saved and went years and years without living for God. Years and years without being in church. Hey, I spent years in some liberal church. I might as well not have even been in church. I probably would have been better off. I spent years in these, in these liberal, dead, NIV, rock music churches. Hey, where are they? You know what? 
I don't know where they are, but I know where they're going to be someday. They're going to be in heaven. And I'm going to tell you something. I want to be the answer to this man's prayer. And I want to be the answer to the prayer of every other person who's burning in hell right now, begging that their friends and loved ones would not come along with them to that place. And I want to be the answer to the prayer of every born-again Christian who's across America praying for some loved one who's in Tempe, Arizona. You say, well, we can't get everybody saved. You know, we can't get everybody saved, but we can preach the gospel to every single person in this city. Yes, we can. And we can at least give everybody a chance. We can at least get them the gospel. And if they don't get saved, fine. But you know what? At least can we give them a chance? Can you participate in soul winning, please? For the sake of the... You say, well, you don't understand what my life is like, Pastor Anderson. You don't understand the struggles that I struggle with. Hey, you don't understand what people are struggling with. We're in hell. It's funny. You know, Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 16, before we got there, he's, he's uh, having an argument before we got to the story about hell, he's having an argument with the Pharisees about divorce. Did you notice that? He's having an argument with them, telling them, look, whosoever put, away, put away his wife and married another committed adultery. And whosoever married her which put away committed adultery. Oh, we can't handle that. Let me tell you about a guy who's burning in hell, and, and let's compare that to the suffering of your bad marriage, Pharisee, that you don't like. Let's compare that to the suffering of, of you not getting along with your wife or getting along with your husband. Let's compare that with the suffering of when uh, you, you backed into a pole and, and dented up your nice new car. We need to get things in perspective. We need to understand that there's more to life than food and raiment. There's more to life than just our problems. There's more to life than, than my financial problems or your financial problems. Hey, there's more to life than relationship problems in your marriage. Hey, there's more to life than, than the things that we can see or touch or feel. Hey, there's a spiritual realm of a heaven and a hell. And we ought to be living with that in mind and understanding that whatever suffering we go through in this life, whatever pain God asks us to endure, whatever cross He asks us to pick up and bear with our lives, it's nothing compared to the sufferings of Jesus Christ that He paid for us in hell. And it's nothing compared to the sufferings that the unsaved people in hell are facing right now. Can, will you suffer a little bit and go out soul winning? Will you endure a little bit of the pain of maybe the hot summertime in Phoenix? I mean, can you endure the pain of going out soul winning when it's 110 degrees outside? Can you endure a little bit of heat so that somebody can never endure the ultimate heat in hell? I mean, can you, can you face the discomfort of having somebody shut the door in your face and tell you to go jump in a lake? It's nothing compared to what we're dealing with when we're talking about hell. None of us can even comprehend what hell is like. Hey, listen, why don't we just decide to suffer, be, be a partaker of the fellowship of the sufferings of Jesus Christ for a little bit. Let's suffer just a tiny bit. Let's stay in church. Let's stay with the Bible reading. Let's get up a little earlier than maybe we want to so we can read the Bible. Let's stay up a little bit later studying the Word of God. Let's stay up a little later maybe praying for lost souls. Hey, maybe we could just go out soul winning, not just maybe just an hour. Maybe we could like push ourselves a little bit further. Maybe we could go to just maybe one more door. You know, we're, we're about to quit. And we say, you know, why don't we just go to one more door so that somebody could maybe never have to see the fires of hell forever. Your life is not that bad. I don't care who you are in this room. My life is not that bad. We're the sons of God. We're going to be in heaven for all eternity. Let's, let's share a little bit of the sufferings right now. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, I thank you so much for saving us, God. It's such a horrible thing to read about hell. It's such a disgusting and horrible place, God. And I thank God that I'm never going to see it. I'm never going to be anywhere near it. Praise the Lord for the blood of Jesus Christ that cleanses us from all sin. But Father, I just pray that you would help us not to just turn the blind eye to the, to the millions that are going to hell. But Father, would you please just use us as your servants and your vessels to warn as many people as we can. Even if we could just save one person from the fires of hell. That would be worth this whole church's existence if we could just get one person saved. I'm sure it would be important to that one person. And I'm sure it would be important to their mom and their brother and their cousin and their aunt and their uncle, dear God. Please just help us to see someone saved this afternoon, our soul winning, dear God. But more importantly, just help us to spend our life yielding our bodies to you, dear God. Letting the Holy Spirit's power rest upon us and guide us and direct us so that we could be used as a soul winner for Jesus for the rest of our lives.